What is up, everyone? I'd like to welcome Olivia Egley. It sounds like a rock star name. Olivia Egley, who was a corporate chief executive, and he's been reshaping his career because he got into the corporate world and he was in the game for two decades and five years, 25 years, and then realized, what the heck is he doing? And he got out. Now he is putting business management, spirituality, and science and hoping to help people integrate that into the business sphere so they can do happy work, which is the name of his podcast. So happy to have Olivier on. And we were just chatting before the show started how he was actually one of the creative directors at Red Bull. And we were talking about formula racing. So I'm sure Olivier has tons of stories that he can share. And when you were in the corporate space, when you first started, I'm sure you didn't feel the way you did at the end of 25 years. What was mm -hmm. what was that process like for you? Because for like me, I left corporate America after like three and a half years. I was like, I'm out of here. I'm done. <laughs> Some people are fast. Some people are quick. Others, not so much. I guess I was slow about that. But I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's a process that I see like take place in a lot of people who are embedded in transactional corporate settings. Mine was really just, I was running after, you know, trophy after trophy after trophy. I was just looking for more and more and more. And, and one day there was either not more or going for more was going to strangle me. I was really going down a rabbit hole that was toxic and unhealthy. I started to become actually what I would consider a toxic person. And at some point I had a leadership role and I've had assumed that role for years. And I look back. And I saw that my path was littered with corpses. I had actually stepped on the back and the shoulders of other people and had not taken them with me just in order to advance myself. So I made good money. I had the titles, I had the accolades and the clout and all that. But I was lacking something that was much more essential, much more human, much more internal. I actually had a hard time looking at myself. I had a hard time talking about my job, about me, about what I did, about what I believed in, because I felt so hollow. I, I really felt like a horrible person. And I realized that I did not want to amount to that. And, and the taps on the back that I got were in no way enough to make up for that feeling. It was not enough. And, and, and I guess for me, it took way longer than it takes other people to realize what is this really about? Why are we here? Why are we doing this? Why are we doing anything at all? Who are we? Right? And, and, and that's when some people start to investigate. I had to investigate after literally almost taking my life. I, I was in such a bad place. I couldn't get up anymore. Started to feel very ill, even though nothing was wrong with me, you know, physically. And that's when I had the choice, you know, make a big decision that goes against what I know or stay in it and just see what happens. But I think we can say that after more than two decades, that see what happens thing doesn't stick anymore. So, yeah, I was kind of like, as you put it before, when we talk, I was kind of like with the back to the wall. I was cornered by my own fallacy of moving on. No, because so. you could be the top performer inside of a company and everyone could be like, oh, that's Olivier. He's the top dog. He's doing this and doing that. I want to be Olivier. And then for myself, I had a realization. No one no one cares outside of this corporate setting what I'm doing in here. I'm just a normal person. And what I do inside the corporate setting doesn't define who I am when I'm not there. What yeah. was your feeling like? I mean, here's the, here's the funny thing. And I have, I have a strong background in psychology. And I've always been interested in psychology and spirituality. So to me, the big questions, you know, about existence and the more, more essential questions that we ask outside of the corporate setting and outside of the work setting, they're really the ones that, that matter to me. It's not about like, you know, how much money can I make? How can I buy this car? How can I step up the ladder? How can I, you know, climb the career ladder faster? It's more about like, what is it to me, to me? And that's when I realized this whole thing where we think we are a business person 
and we are a private person is BS. It's the biggest lie in the in in the existence of modern civilization because we are one person. No, no matter who you are, how you spin it, you are one human being. So to see yourself holistically with regards to your work and your private life, that is mandatory. But I didn't think so. I was taught that you have to be this, you know, this performer, this uber performer that leads people and moves forward and goes, you know, against the grain and like, you know, innovates. And then you have to be this loving, kind friend and family member and good member of uh, the community. And I realized I was starting to become schizophrenic. I, I had split personalities and that started to crack. And I'm here to tell you that after having worked with almost a thousand corporate clients, it affects everyone to any you know different degree, but it affects anyone. If you put yourself long enough, you expose yourself long enough to these two push and pull forces, your tapestry starts to crumble into crack. And that is something that we usually, we just paint over it, you know? We paint over it with a, with, with a salary increase, with, you know, like your nameplate on, you know, on your office door, a little, little trophy here, a little reward there. But it doesn't matter because emotionally, the person that's inside the heart it's not okay with it. The heart doesn't care about promotions. The heart cares about you being you, you giving yourself a voice. And, and, and someone like me for so long suppressed that voice in favor of remuneration, in favor of cookies and, you know, prices and awards and, and things. And the problem is that that's the reality of transactional corporate settings. Transactional corporate settings are here to feed the transaction and you're just an asset to support that transaction. So of course they want to keep you in that game and it's your job to realize how far you can go before you crack. And, and, and we all know that mental health is a big issue in, you know, in the working population. And it's not for the reasons that we think. We think there are there are social issues at hand, cultural issues. Yes, they are here, but at the base, it's not. You don't have to hate the player; you have to play, hate the game. And the game is one that wants you to be two different people, when really you are just one. So now, in my work, what I do is I bring back this holistic approach that we are not apart from nature but we are a part of nature. And if you take, for example, an apple tree, an apple tree is an apple tree day and night, 24 seven, it's dedicated to its cause. It will not change making apples to like suddenly making pears because there's a higher demand for pears or because the seasons have changed, it will just dedicate itself to its own nature. And when I realized that we human beings too, we have a nature. And if we honor and respect that nature and turn that into a business or make that the forefront of our job, of our work, we don't have to lie to ourselves anymore. We become that one person that is honest and in integrity. And that's so funny because I have sat in so many boardroom meetings where we, we discussed integrity as an important corporate culture value points and it's bs if at the bottom the culture doesn't allow for people to be in integrity we have to foster cultures where people are allowed to be who they are and and you know young me i didn't even want to be that person i wanted to be the winner i wanted to be the guy who crushes it i wanted to be number one i wanted to bring home, you know, the bacon. I wanted to be celebrated. I had all these ego sides to me because that was my upbringing. I was brought up that way. This is how we teach and educate people. You go to university. Heck, you even go to high school or primary school. <clears throat> you get grades, you get marks, you get somehow put on a scale. And now you know if the number is higher, you're doing better. 
turns out there is actually not much correlation between the number the world gives you and the way you feel about your life. That is, this correlation is man-made. It does not exist. You create that correlation, but you also have the power to disconnect and reshape it, reframe it. And thank God I found a way to do that. Thank God I stepped out of that because I really don't know where I would be now. So many examples are going through my head based on what you said, such as I remember I was the top performer at the company I was working at. I didn't miss one goal for an entire year. And by that, I was in like the top five people in the country, like at what I did. And then I started to make money and started to feel guilty for making money almost because I realized how much more money I was making compared to the people I was around, like friendships. And I had an identity shift too. I was like, what the heck? Like I'm buying houses. All my friends are still living in apartments. I went and bought like a Rolex <laughs> just because I wanted to because mm -hmm. I thought it was yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, and then like one day I remember our team, you know, it's all about the team, right? The team needs to hit the goal. You know, sometimes you know, Olivier is going to have a great quarter and that's going to help the team hit the goal. And then maybe Olivier has like a mediocre quarter, but someone else steps up and the team wins. Mm -hmm. And then I remember our team hit all of our goals and our manager's compensation was tied to the team goals. And I needed his help with something I wasn't getting compensated for, which was going to allow me to hit all of my goals. But since the team hit their, all their goals, it didn't turn into a priority. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I took like a mental note. I was like, wow, I don't matter. Yeah, yeah. What was in your experience brain. like in terms of finally getting the guts to leave? <laughs> oh, you ask all the good questions. You know, um, it was crazy. It was insane. It, it's You could compare it a little bit like toothache no uh when 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 you hurt your finger you know when you bend your fingernail whatever you get over it you know it grows out it's fine when your tooth hurt you have to go to the dentist you have to face the darkness you have to you have to do it there is no other way the toothache will not just go away it will get worse and at some point it's just going to drag you down and it's going to destroy you that's at least how toothache feels right i mean i don't know for some people it's different for me it's bad i really I'm not a fan i'm not a fan but i had gone through the cycle of making a choice to leave the toxicity of this toxic reward and punishment system for years like it took me about three or four years of the thumb screws getting tighter and tighter before I actually got a physical response in me where it's like, I will physically not make it through another year. I will not make it. My mind will fall apart by the end of the year. I have to make a choice. And so what, what it was in my case, I had to completely cut out everything. I had to step away from everything. I had to increase the silence because I was so embedded in the noise. I come from a media and uh, advertising and communications background. So noise and total immersion is like, it's, it's the routine. You're constantly immersed with emails, conversations, meetings, whether they're relevant or not, doesn't matter. You're just in it. But I had to suddenly realize, hey, I have to step away from everything. Before I get even clarity on what needs to happen, I need to take the time off. And, and I'm not talking about taking the time off to travel the world or, you know, like walk through, a, you know, walk along a certain like a spiritual path. It was literally just sitting in silence, just being away from everything. And I did that for a couple of days. And during those days, it's almost like a voice in me that I had suppressed for years started to talk again. Like I heard something inside of me say like, I don't know if I'm like allowed to cuss on this podcast. So I'm going to like find a way. I just click a box and said explicit language. So you're good. 
Okay, good. So like that was a voice inside of me saying like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, seriously, I was having a conversation with myself for the first time in 25 years. There was something inside of me telling me, we don't like this. We don't feel okay. And this is going nowhere. And so what I, what I did really back then is what I signed a contract with myself. I made a pact of accountability. And I said, here's one thing I'm going to do different. One thing. I'm going to bring an intention into my life. I'm done with expectations. I'm done with expecting payments. I'm done expecting, you know, to move on and forward. I'm done with all these things. I am now going to show up with an intention because that's the only thing you can control in your life, what your intention is. Expectations make you vulnerable. But in the corporate setting, all, everything is about expectations. You just said it, right? With the goal setting, hitting the targets. Those are expectations. Those are signs of scarcity. Someone is afraid that a number will not be hit. And now the team has to suffer. Now people have to go to war and they have to bring home that bacon or else there will be punishment. And I realized if I don't want that in my life, I have to change myself how I look at work and how I look at life. And I realized nature is the only teacher I need. And growing up in Switzerland, we're surrounded by nature. And it baffles me that I went to so many business schools. I went, I, I, I did all my continued education, you know, and I taught at business schools. And yet all we do is read books and listen to smart podcasts, but we're never going to the forest or out into nature and just stare at what nature does. And I did that. And my intention was to become open to the teachings of nature. Because in the end, everything always goes back to that. And I was like, if I don't do it now and discover it too late, you know, then I will miss all those years where I could apply these teachings. And so what I did different that day, where I got my the balls, as you said, is... I, I phrased the intention to see myself and to choose myself. I said, I'm done choosing things that other people imply, uh, you know, uh, impose on me. I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to choose myself first before I choose any concept, any number, anything out there. I will choose me. I will relate to myself. And the instant I did that, everything flipped. Everything changed. Because any email I got, any request I got, any, any meeting I was invited to, I now looked at it through that, you know, the glasses of self-relation. Like, how does that relate to my peace? How does help that grow? Like, how does that help me grow? How does that feed into me? And I was able to very quickly realize this is all utter bullshit. I have become captive to a system that I allowed to hold me captive and it is my job to step out of it. And, and what happens when you do that, when you phrase an intention to choose yourself, it doesn't happen overnight. I don't want anyone to think that, you know, that's how I did it. It, it, it took months and months and months. But when you do that, the desire in you to make a move grows and desire is the ultimate pushing force an intention that is true sparks desire and after four months i just handed in my resignation letter i stepped away from a high six-figure salary job with great you know perspective um great you know future possibilities i stepped away from it it was so clear at that moment because it took that time that that was the right move. I did not know what was going to be the next thing, but I knew that this was not part of my present self anymore. And it was the best thing I ever did, but it was the scariest thing I ever did because with regards to who I was back then, I went completely against everything I had ever learned and ever been taught. It was in the eyes of my friends, a foolish thing to do. My parents they, you know, they chastised me. They're like, wanted to crucify me. They're like, and now what? 
because that is commonly how we see things, right? You 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 stay in the game. You got to stay in that game. But the instant I realized that this game is not for me, this is not my game, I had to leave the game. And what did I do instead? I had to create my own game. And this is what the years after that led to that I realized, hey, we each have our own game to play. So I developed my own game. And yeah. Well, this is the thing. You get a game. You learn the game. You beat the game. You move to a new game. You don't just keep playing the same game over and over because you can get really good at the same game over and over if you keep playing it. In order to get to the next level, you have to start a new game and literally go into the new game knowing that you're going to suck at this new game in the beginning. And it's going to be a little frustrating. And then accept the challenge to get good at the game that's even harder than the previous game. And now you've just taken yourself from normal to expert level and then you go to you know super expert level but i mean there's levels to it and most people are too scared to go back to easy mode to learn a new game i i mean i have an opinion on that because i yeah, studied what game, is it let's hear it I, I studied game theory for a little bit like ne when, economic when like, game theory no just general game theory as it applies to mathematics uh, which influences, of course, economics. But there are two approaches to the game theory, the one that you play to win and the one where you play to play. The infinite game versus the finite game. Traditional economic marketplaces and corporate structures, they play the finite game. You know, hit the target. Hit the target. When you hit the target, the game is over. New game begins. Higher stakes. That's what you talked about. I don't believe in that game. That game is what drained me. That's exactly what I did. I started at a super amateur level and I worked my way up and I reached that boss level, free boss level. And I realized I will not survive the final boss. I will not, it will take everything. And yes, I will have the almost seven figure salary and the bonuses and everything. Great, good for the ego. Very, very bad for you. What I realized is I have to find a game I love playing a game that I own and that I will play for the rest of my life. That one game. That's the game that the apple tree plays. You know, being an apple tree is literally the only game that every plant in the, in the world plays one game. It's game. It's game of renewal cycle of spring, celebration of summer, losing the leaves in fall, and respite and rest in winter and coming back. That's the game. That's the cycle of life. That cycle, we're part of it, but we deny it. We say we're not. We say we're better. We're like a higher form of uh, you know, evolution that doesn't need to fall for these cycles. We we want to like, we want to progress. We want to like kill it, hustle, get out of it, and you know, like just be the winning figure of this whole thing. Well, that is very, very dangerous because it's very unnatural. That would mean that if nature followed that principle, there would be one tree in the world and it would be fucking enormous. But look at a forest. It thrives because it's full of beautiful, different kinds of trees and organisms that function in correlation and deep collaboration. That's what an econo economic system should look like. It is the collaboration by means of everyone, everybody playing their own game and every single game correlating to the other games. So what I mean by that is that as long as we as human beings, as individuals, don't find that one thing in us, you know, that one thing that wants to speak through us, as long as we don't find that and make that the source of our doings, of our businesses, of our jobs, of our circles of friends, we will remain victims and slaves to other games, to other systems. And then it doesn't matter how good we look, how well we perform on the, in the books. We will never feel like it is really our game. And that was always my problem. I always felt like, yeah, I just got that award at this award show. But somehow I feel like I don't deserve it. Everybody says I deserve it. You worked hard for this. But I feel like 
I should work hard for this, but I don't relate. I don't relate to it. And by the way, just as you said before, I don't matter. You know what happens the day after an award ceremony, Josh? You know what happens the next day? Everybody has forgotten you. The night off, when you get your award, you get like all those taps on the back. Hey, I'll call you in the morning. Hey, we need to work together. This, hey, great job. This, this, and that. Next day, crickets. Because the game has been reset. It's back to zero. Next trophy. Next award. It's insane. It's mind rattling. But there are, there's not, there are not many business schools that go against that principle. You know, I went to so many and all my professors and teachers, they pushed for that. Yes, go hit the numbers, reset. Higher numbers, hit them, reset. Boom, you know, it's this sawtooth-like ascension before the big fall. And, and I have worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and owners who, were face, who had to face illness, terminal illness. Some of them have like two or three, triple digit millions in the bank. You know how much that money matters when you're in that place? Oh, less than zero. It's like, I cannot even recall how many emails and phone calls I had where they said, I would gladly give everything away, every single penny, if I could just wake up feeling okay for one day. I mean, why do we have to have our backs against the wall before we realize that. Where, you know, this transactional orgy that we celebrate in, in, in our professional mannerism is not the aim of life. It is not the path of life. We're not here to become the biggest tree in the forest. We're here to become a valuable member of a forest that is thriving so that we are okay and the system is okay. Because only if we and the system are okay, can we continue? Can we expand? Can we grow as ourselves? This is, you know, there, there's no infinite growth. There's just the growth of the self, the sensible growth as the human beings that we are. And business is an amazing way to support that. It's an amazing way to bring that into the world and be part of it. But taking? Just taking, 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 hitting, hitting, hitting. You, you know as well as me that some of the targets, some of the goals that were given to us by our team leaders and managers, they're insane. They're just taken out of thin air. Like we have to increase our sales by 7.7%. Why? Why? Where does that number come from? Just because? Because growth is the only way. Only cancer grows for the sake of growth. You can never grow for the sake of growth. Your growth has to have meaning. And this is why money has to be attached to meaningful growth. And this is why only meaningful growth supports meaningful money. When you make money that you feel like you don't deserve, that's sad money. Because it's money that does not support that kind of growth. And I'm so happy that now every dollar that I make, because I make it in this game that is mine, is happy, is a happy dollar. Because it supports exactly that growth I am here to experience. Love it. I'm talking a lot. You know, you just well, that was that. that was beautiful. And <laughs> it seems like to me what people need to do is figure out what game they want to play and then master that game. And be happy with the game that you're playing and don't care what anyone else says. That, so, that is it. That is it. What kind of tree are you? You know, you're born a tree. What, 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 what is your fruit? What is the fruit you're born to give? You know, what is the fruit you're born to give? This is literally, this is what my business is all about. This is what I do with my clients. I'm just here to explain to them that the fruit that they're going after is not theirs to have. But what is it? What is it? There's no school in the world that teaches them. Everybody just goes after the fruit that sells the most right now. And that has created this competitive, struggling economy where everybody wants a slice of the same cake. And that cake is not getting bigger 
at the same rate as more people are coming in. And this is why we have this kind of inequality. But if everybody just baked little pies, not just little pies, but they have their whole pie. I always say I'd rather have a small pond than be a tiny fish in an ocean filled with sharks. Just my pond. And my buddies are with me in my pond. And we're good. You know? It's, it's, it is so wonderful what nature has to teach us. If we just listen and watch. Because in the end, nature was here before us. And will be here after us. So for us to be arrogant enough to think that we don't have to follow the rules and bylaws of nature is so foolish, but it's an opportunity. It is a huge opportunity. Yeah, that was awesome. So happy that it, you went on a fantastic point of view and was able to share that with everyone. So thanks everyone for listening. We'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone.